Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning, everyone. My name is Clara, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm grateful to be sober and a proud member of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'd like to thank Bill for that introduction, and I'd like to thank Bill for asking me to come and share my experience, strength, and hope with you this beautiful Easter morning, and and the committee, and everyone that's been so kind and so gracious, and the hospitality is that we all know in Southern California, and in any meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I'm, I'm just over overcome with emotions this morning as I look out in this room on this beautiful Easter morning, and thank you uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I always feel this way when I stand here and, and see your smiling faces. I always have that incredible feeling that I'm standing in the sunlight of the Spirit. And I would like to welcome all of you, the new, new ones, the comers who are stood this morning and, and, and the young man who received the book uh, to Alcoholics Anonymous. And one of my favorite readings in that big book, which is the basic text of our program, is in the back of the book. And it's entitled Spiritual Experience. And at the end of that reading it says, Contempt prior to investigation will leave a man in everlasting ignorance. So I welcome you. Uh, we are here to tell our story in a general way, what it used to be like and what happened and what it's like today. And by the time I got crawled into my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is this past Monday, was April the 9th, 1974. I'm celebrating 27 years of continuous sobriety from that meeting. Thank you for the applause, but the applause, be, uh, is, I'm here because of the grace of God and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and um, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, the fellowship and the love that I found here when I stumbled in here uh, almost on my knees uh, that first at that first meeting. And when I got here, you heard chapter three read this morning and you've heard it all weekend and and in that list of insanities, one of them says we switched to natural wines. Well, man, when I got here, I was a full-blown winette. <laughs> and it says we switched to natural wines. Well, man, I had switched to ripple. <laughs> and that's not one of your natural wines. As a matter of fact, I don't think a single grape. <laughs> Was Alan do that stuff, man? You know, it was, you know but it, it it worked for me. At the end, you know, it wasn't about um, making me feel better. You know, I I'm mean, in the beginning. I always drank because it made me feel good. It made me feel better. And I, you know, I and all those fantasies that I always had in my head, I I was able to act out. I was just drinking by this time to stay alive, to breathe in and out, and. I had lost everything, thank you, God, that, you know, you took away from me everything that I wanted in, in, in order to give me what I needed. It had come that time in my life when um, I needed to stop drinking and I, I needed to find a God of my understanding and I simply needed to stop dying because by then um, I was sick of living, but I was afraid to die. It was all gone, the big house, the... You know, the car, the business, the family. And, you know, I, it was that painful time in my life when I'm sure some of you have experienced that when the people who love you the most look at you with that look. And I stood outside of that house while the marshal put the lock on the door and, and that older son of mine was 18 and the other two younger ones, one was 12, my next son was 12 and my little daughter was 8 years old stood outside and watched that marshal putting that lock on the door of the bank and just repossessing everything, me on the internal revenue, tons of money. And I stood outside there, you know, and I'm 
I, I, that ex-husband had gone, and, and you know, and my life was that second uh, part of the first step. You know, my life was totally unmanageable, and I couldn't stop drinking. Um, I looked at that son, and he, you know, he looked at me with that that look of of an eighteen-year-old son who had tears in his eyes, but they didn't run because I guess it wasn't macho for for an eighteen-year-old son to look at a, a drunken mother. And I, I and he said to me, "But I don't even know who you are, and I don't know where you're going, but uh, I'm not going with you." And my choice was, I, uh, by that time, I no longer had choices to go to the better places to live, but I, I, I headed for South Central Los Angeles to the ghetto. And I never dreamed that that first drink that I'd taken as a student at the Boston Museum School of Fine Arts, an honor student at the Boston Museum School of Fine Arts in Boston, uh, was going to take me, you know, 27 years later, you know, to the ghetto of South Central. And I remember the journey, picking up the bag and calling the cab because I heard that the rent was cheap. Went in and then that little cottage in, in that area, and I, and I drew the drapes, and I am sure that I was doomed to die of this disease, and I didn't know I had a disease. I just knew that life wasn't fair. Um, those two younger ones, and I applied for food stamps and welfare, and the liquor store was three doors away on the corner. Um, I, by that time, I was wearing this bright red wig. <laughs> and I'm a real alcoholic, the kind that's described in the book. You know, because I took me, I drank for years without getting into trouble. And it was just like the, maybe the last four or five years of, of my drinking that I'd reached that point where I was in horrendous blackouts. And, um, you know, I come actually from the jazz world, you know, Boston, New York, Harlem, and then L.A., and, and I, and I pass out in that overstuffed chair with a terrorcloth robe on and this weird wig, and, and that wig had bangs. <laughs> and I come out of blackout around 10, 11 o'clock at night, and, 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 and the wig be on sideways, and, <laughs> I get up and look at myself in the mirror, and I could feel my heart beating like a drum. It would beat so rapidly sometimes that it felt as if the, my eardrums were going to explode from the pain. And I knew what I had to do because I—I I, I don't know about a lot of you, but I was—I lived in jazz clubs and, and bars for years. I was a bar drinker, and I knew I needed to hear the music. And I need to get out of that chair and get dressed and get over to the nearest sleazy bar and crawl up on that stool, the end stool, you know, and look into that mirror behind that bartender. You know, and look down the, 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 that row with all those other geniuses <laughs> sitting down there. <laughs> Staring in the, in the mirror and in, in, in those fantasies. And, Probably feeling like, you know, that song about Eleanor Rigby, wondering where all those other lonely people were coming from. And I don't know about you ladies, but I met a lot of out-of-work airline pilots. <laughs> Once in a while, they'd throw in a neurosurgeon. <laughs> There was one I never shall forget him. He was very attractive. We were sitting there sipping on our uh, wine with 59 cent a glass, and we were sipping on our ripple there. And, <laughs> and he's looking up and down the bar, really nervous. And you know, there's a little there's a little paragraph in the vision for you that says some of us sought sordid places, looking for understanding, companionship, and approval. And I was also looking for love in the wrong places. And he looked up and down a few times, and he turned to me. He was very attractive, you know, beautiful teeth, kind of the Denzel Washington type, you know. And he introduced himself. He told me that he was a retired lieutenant colonel. 
in the United States Air Force, and I was really impressed because <laughs> he's about 24 years old. <laughs> He'd already retired. <laughs> Very nervous cat. You know, he just kept looking around. So um, he finally said to me, actually, um, I fly secret missions, baby. <laughs> All over the world. Really? And he looked around a few more times. He said, uh, last night I flew over Russia. <laughs> So I know I got a case on my hands this time. I don't know what to do with this kind of relationship. And um, I said, you did? I said, I know you did. Because I was with you. <laughs> I don't know what would happen, you know, between those, you know, working out with those geniuses on those stools and and the legal uh, uh, hour at two o'clock in the morning when the when the bars closed. We were always legends in our own heads by two. And I don't know what would happen to me. I'd get dumped in out of those black house in front of that house at that awful hour of the morning, three and four and five o'clock in tall. And I'd come to out of those black house in tall, wet grass in a field position making deals with God. And it always seemed so cold, and it always seemed so dark. It was always darkest right before dawn. Dogs traveled in packs in that area. In those days, there were metal trash cans out on the sidewalk. And I can remember the packs of them passing by as I... I'm there in that, in, in that, in that field position making deals with God. And that's the, all the, those best deals were made in that position. You hear them screaming and fighting each other. And it took several of them to push the can into the street. And I could still hear the ringing noise of the lid as it rolled down the street and wobbled down to quiet. It seems like the whole world was asleep. And I'm dying in the grass. I would um, say, God, if you get me off the ground this morning, I'm never going back to that bar again. I never did say anything about I'm going to stop drinking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not, they are not nice people over there. And uh, <laughs> as I was getting, lying in that grass so often, you know, making deals with God. The face of my beautiful little eight-year-old daughter would come into my consciousness. And she'd say things to me like, Mom, you know, you always promised me that you're going to come to PTA meeting. But you never come. All of my friends' parents show up, and you get drunk. I cannot tell you how that used to pain me. The guilt I used to feel. And by this time, I am crying silent tears about those broken dreams and unresolved relationships and those broken promises that I always made to my children that I couldn't, treat, uh, that I couldn't keep. I never could explain to them that, you know, when I took a drink, the drink took me and then I gave it power because I couldn't stop drinking. But I pat her on the head and and I say, well, Tina, next time you have a PTA meeting, just let me know. And uh, she never answered me. She'd just walk away. But I stand here this morning, 27 years uh, uh, sober, and I haven't been to a PTA meeting yet. <laughs> because what would happen is a phenomenon of craving would start that the wonderful Dr. Silkworth, in his opinion, says starts with us. Because the moment my eyes were open, the insanity returned, and what I knew I needed was a drink. And when I get ready to, do, to start off with a PTA meeting, you see, I have to have a drink first. And then I just never could seem to get there. But then I'd get up off the ground and brush myself off and stagger around and, 
and see who's looking. I want to tell you, nobody cares about how you look in the, in the ghetto, whether it's in the afternoon or in the early hours in the darkness. And, uh, but looking good almost killed me out there in the streets. Um, I looked around, and there was a woman who lived across the street. I don't know if any of you ever had a neighbor like her, uh, but I don't think that woman. You know, we talk about selfishness and self-centeredness. And that was in, in egos and, and alcoholics and arms about our personalities and boy, I was full of that. And I looked across the street because I thought she was always looking at me. I don't know. She didn't really, I don't even know that she knew I was down there. Uh, uh, but I could see her curtains moving. So I get myself straightened up, you know, straighten up the wig and wipe the dew off my shoulders and, and, uh, <laughs> and I see the little curtains moving and I get her to faint. Huh? You know, you know, getting it was about four or five little steps there, and I would straighten up and walk cool because I don't want her to think I'm drunk, you know. And <laughs> so I get up those steps and I get through that door and, and I lean on the door and I'm dying, physically, emotionally, and spiritually dying. And I'm so sick. And I don't, I don't know whether you know it's going to be blood this time or that green vial that would come up because I, I was drinking my, my meals. I really wasn't eating it by then. And, charge down that hall and get to that dirty bathroom and, and get on my knees in front of the toilet bowl, do a few chin-ups <laughs> on that cold porcelain, sliding around on the, trying to find a comfortable place to rest. And I don't know if you've ever come out of a blackout on the floor with your head leaning against the toilet, but there's something about the room spinning and uh, and I try to stop the spin, and the two words that always greeted me was American Standard. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> get up off that floor and get dressed and make the run. You know, put, a, put on those tight jeans, put on a bad leather jacket, put on some stock by earrings. They hung all the way down to my shoulders and slap on that wig. And <laughs> by this time, my white El Dorado was gone, and I was my mode of transportation was a pair of gold fuzzy house slippers. <laughs> <laughs> Tiptoe past the door, don't wake those kids up, because I promised them yesterday that I was not going down to the liquor store. You see, but when I needed that drink, the insanity was more powerful than any promise that I could make a living soul. Get to that front door, open it quietly, and, and sneak down the steps in the darkness of the night, and, you know, try to get there at 6 o'clock when, when the liquor store opened, and uh, feeling like a thief, tipping to a past three houses to get down on Western Avenue. Stand in front of the door and wait for the man to come. <clears throat> and leaning on the door and wondering, how did I ever get from that place to this place? How did I ever get from that loving home of lovely parents? And I, 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 was, I was born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia, in a very affluent family. And wonderful parents and, and brothers and sisters and a successful father. My father was a full-blooded Cherokee Indian who was born on a reservation in Cherokee, North Carolina. And, you know, he'd migrated there, and he had a wonderful life. And, you know, we had everything on the outside that was supposed to make us fit and be somebody. And I'm leaning on the door and wondering, how, you know, they, they talk about in the book about that feeling of pitiful and comprehensible demoralization. Been there, have done that, and I know what that feels like. And as a woman alcoholic, and I know that pain. Finally, this guy would get there, and I'd check it in, you know, truck in behind him and stand at the counter, and he'd put away the change, and I would, <clears throat> you know, you know, try to be cute. Of course, I hadn't been cute for a very long time by now. And, <laughs> and I'd watch him put the change away, and he'd say silly things, something about clerks in the ghetto early in the morning. I don't know if any of you have had that experience. 
you know, they can be very cruel. And uh, he put my, I didn't have to ask for my choice anymore. He knew it was Ripple. And he just shoved it in the bag, put his elbow on the counter and crossed his legs and played with the bag, the paper bag at the top of it, and said to me, sweetheart, who's drinking all this Ripple so early in the morning? And um, I look at him, I couldn't stand him. Um, <laughs> I said, I have house guests, sweetheart. <laughs> He said, you serve your house guest ripple? <laughs> I'd take it out of his hand, and I'd get out of that little door past the little plate glass window and or go around the side of the building and lean on the building. You see, my fine days of drinking was over, and I didn't have to wor- wor- worry about Baccarat crystal glasses that I used to drink out of and, and the pop of bottle openers and stirrers and, and napkins, soft music and faces of smiling, handsome men. Those days were over. I wasn't sitting in the grand clubs of New York City and palling around with the likes of the late, great Billie Holiday and Louis Armstrong and all the great to the jazz world. That's where I'd lived for many years. And I just unscrew the top off of that ripple and get back to that house and sit in that chair. Stare out of the window as the dawn really came up. And, and you know, you know that, that thing about, you know, sitting in that chair and watching the dawn and, and, and feeling that feeling probably with a man who said, I had a dream last night that life was passing me by. And I'm sitting in the chair dying and life is going. Hear those kids go off to school. You know, it all started with that one drink in, in, a, in, a, in a jazz club in, 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 in Boston. And I was a student. I think it was my second year. And, and I'd never seen alcohol in my life. I grew up in Georgia in, in a very staunch... Um, uh, uh, conservative, Baptist faith. I have nothing against that today. You know, I study the book of Alcoholics Anonymous and we agnostics, and I, I, I have no problems with that. But I had a lot of problems with it with my mother and and, and all, the entire environment. Uh, and I grew up, and I was I was I was sheltered, and I just was overcome with with fear. I, I really believe that my life was uh, motivated by fear from I, I, don't, I don't know what from. I've done many inventories, and it's not important today, but I was a loner, and I went to Booker T. Washington High School, and, and I, I won that art scholarship, and that got me out of Atlanta. I can remember sitting on a segregated train, leaving Atlanta, and giving Atlanta the finger because, um, <laughs> you know, I wasn't going to ever go back down there. <laughs> And because I was restless, irritable, and discontented, I believe, right out of the chute, man. I could have had a little drinky coup, uh, probably in the first grade, <laughs> you know, to get me to the second grade. I mean, I had problems. <laughs> I had lots of problems at, at, five, at, at, at five years old. And uh, so when I, when I got to, to Boston, it was going to be different. It never occurred to me as I made these geographics that I was taking me with me. Never occurred to me. I walk into that school, no, I don't belong here either. You know, my feeling about excitement lasted for about two weeks. And, you know, and after two weeks, I got to move on. You, say, you, know, you know, Clint talked about, you know, that search. I, I, was, I, know, I know now that it was that eternal search from years ago of, of something was wrong with me, and I now know it was that inside of me that I never could touch. It always felt like the hole was deep and very dark. And I didn't know what it was that I wanted out of life. And so I was wandering down the street. Georgia was a dry state when I drew up, grew up there, and I didn't know that alcohol was even on the planet Earth. I'd never seen a person intoxicated, and I, I thought about it for years, and I don't ever remember having seen anyone. Uh, but I love jazz music, and i sitting in that art school, but I really wanted to be a performer. And I don't know how in the world I ever got into that fantasy, because I can't sing and I can't dance. And <laughs> I was never allowed to go to the movies, and I remember I'm 19 years old, and I go to my first movie, and, I'm, and I loved it. I loved people up on that screen, and I thought, oh, wow, look at this, and, and they were always dancing and doing all this wonderful thing, and I just, I could feel it inside, and walking down the street, and I, with, with, with another student, and she, I heard the music, and I said, let's go in there and see what they're doing, and um, 
we go in there, and I was dimly lit, and the, and I can I can still remember the aroma of the cigarettes and the booze, and down at the end of the bar was this rather courtly lady, and she and she's blasting out this low blues, and my heart started pounding with excitement. It's called that feeling of living on the edge. Love that feeling. And I, and and and, and the, the bartender turned around to uh, to us and he said, "What are you going to have to drink?" And neither one of us knew we'd never had a drink before. But I remember in the movies they always were talking about martinis. <laughs> and I was about to commit my first hip slick cool act, you know. <laughs> and I leaned over and I looked at the bartender. And I said, "Well, have a martini, honey." I said, "And make it dry." <laughs> I want to date myself because. Uh, that's what uh, 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 you know, all the stars were saying at the time, you know, and they, and, and they, they used to always talk about that, and they were dancing, you know, Ginger Rogers, and they were all dancing around and talking about martinis, whether they should have all of it or not. It was a big discussion. So I said, here, make it dry. And uh, he turns around with his two lovely glasses, and he, and he, he even and all, they look like lemonade. I didn't know you sip drinks. <laughs> You know, in Georgia, it is hot in the summertime, and we drank a lot of lemonade, and that's what it looked like to me. So I just picked it up, man, I dumped it out. I was a pig from the gate. <laughs> <laughs> but I remember the way it make, made me feel. Dr. Silkworth said men and, drink, men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. It was wonderful. Here I am, 19 years old, never had a date, terrified of men. Walk out on the dance floor with a glass, empty glass in my hand with a permanent smile. <laughs> looking around, man, looking around. And um, they were all dancing. It was so wonderful. I right away got myself some new friends. I called them colorful, but the big book calls them loyal companions. <laughs> So I started crawling up on those stools, and I, 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 I hooked up right away with the pimps, the hookers, the madams, and the bad boys. <laughs> and I learned how to walk the walk and talk the talk. And that walking that walk and talking that talk took me straight to South East Central. <laughs> you know, many years later. Uh, I met my a, a young man on that stool one night, and, 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 and uh, we... He came from a similar background, a wonderful family from Boston, and and uh, he didn't know much about drinking, so we learned to drink together, and we learned to do what, it, what you do in the streets together. You know, I know all about street life, and there's a song out here that's been out for a while now called Street Life. They've been using it in a commercial recently, but I can relate to it, and Randy Crawford is, is still uh, one of my um, favorite uh, jazz artists of, of this era. And and in that song, I relate to it fully. And she said, I paraphrase the words. You know, said, if you're young, don't get old in the streets. Cold's going to hit you in the back, and you're going to nickel and dime your life away. There's a million lives to play out there until you play all your life away. And then you look back one day, it was all a masquerade. And I remember sitting in my first meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and looking back over my life and sitting in that first meeting. And what I saw was that, that, that feeling they talk about the drowning person. And what I realized is alcohol had stripped me of all human dignity. Had stripped me of all moral values, all family values, all those values I had been, you know, tried, they had tried to teach me as I was growing up. And, and, um, I, and he and I started dating and then we got married. We had a little son. And uh, we shoved him off on his uh, grandparents to raise him. And, and I always feel emotional after all these years about uh, the guilt and the pain that I felt and couldn't tell anybody about it but because life was too wonderful in the fast lane. I, I, um, I would have to go and visit him, and I don't know if you've had that experience of looking into the eyes of a child and you keep continuing to, I continued to lie to him because I couldn't tell the truth. You know, doctors, there's a little line, Dr. Silver says, we come to a place where we can't differentiate the difference between the truth and the false. And, you know, I have to get back in that car and, and get back on those stools in Boston and, and hang out with that crowd. I loved it. I loved the excitement of sitting on stools and, and going out to breakfast with the late 
great legend Billie Holiday and living in that world. It was so exciting and it, while it worked. And um, then, then there comes a time, you know, when in a marriage that it sick as that relationship that we I was sharing with with that, that ex-husband, and we're all were doing the same thing, different, you know, one of those kind of situations, and. And you know, I was getting restless and irritable, and I, and I wanted more. I'm greedy. I'm very greedy. I was telling a friend of mine we were out to dinner a couple of years ago in Beverly Hills, and I said, you know, I've always been greedy. I've always wanted more. I probably, when I was a baby, you know, when I was born, coming down out of the chute, you know, the doctor smacked me on the little bum, you know, out there, and and and, and, I, and I probably screamed more, you know, as I you know, so. <laughs> So he was out of town a lot, and one and I just knew that there was some man out there who was going to be wonderful. He was going to rescue me from life. Just take care. Life was nothing but a bowl of cherries anyway. Why not just get all you could get? And, and so I'm, <laughs> I was sitting there on the stool with Billy Honda, in an after hour joint one morning. And she turned to me, and this guy walked up, and you know, and I knew I had named him Mr. Wonderful, and he walked up to the to the bar, and, and she turned and, and and she introduced me to him, and, and I'll describe him. You're talking about I was in the second step long ago, and uh, and he had a black hat turned down all the way around. He had a, a blue top coat over his shoulders. This dude was so cool he couldn't get his arms through the sleeves, <laughs> you know, and uh, and. Uh, <laughs> He reached in his pocket, pulled out a wad of money. I love money. <laughs> <laughs> and he peeled out ten one hundred dollar bills and he spread it on the top of the bar like this and he leaned over and he said, Spend it. Yeah. Oh, I didn't believe in God, but <laughs> <laughs> I looked at that money and I picked it up and we spent it. And he turned out to be the head of the mafia of the Boston family. And now I began to ride in the back of limousine with bodyguards. And I want to tell you what a ride that one was. And going to New York, just the opening, a lot of you young ones, the younger people out here don't remember those, those jazz days, but when they had the opening of uh, Birdland in New York, and Billy Eckstein was the opening star, and the mob, and we all piled in, and it was so exciting. And then one morning, this began to change, and I could sense that something was changing, and I'm sitting on a beautiful Sunday morning like this, and in the back of that limousine, and and that darkness was getting darker, that hole was getting deeper. Everything we did, you know, was just never enough. Couldn't find it, and I'm sitting there at that light, and we were all hung over, and I called this guy Mr. Wonderful, and uh, we were all just hung over, and I looked across the street, and, on the, and, and there was these wonderful young families. My, my son's 10 years old, and I hardly know who he is because I can, I'm too ashamed to go visit him anymore. And they were about to cross the street to this beautiful New England church. And it was like a boy said to me, Claire, something is wrong with your life. And I agreed. The problem was Boston. <laughs> if we just get out of Boston, and my husband's uh, uh, family owned a, a moving company, and he was out of town a lot, and he came in town and said, we're moving to L.A. And he agreed. And so off we went. And we grabbed that son and put him in the back seat. It felt like a little stranger was sitting back there. And I, I was so uncomfortable. I didn't know what to say to him. I didn't know how to say. I didn't know what to say. You know, I was never around. I don't know anything about kids. You know, I just, we got into L.A. And we were, I was going to, it was going to be different. And I was going to go to those PTAs. And I was going to try to change my life and, but you see, I'm an alcoholic. I crawled up on the first stool, and, and it on and began. We started a, a property management and maintenance business, and it got better, and, then, and on and on and on. My family all were very successful in their careers, moved to the L.A. area, and, and, and pretty soon I'm out of control with the drinking. And I, you know, I hear them saying things to me like, uh, you know, we, we've been noticing you, you know, you drink too much. I don't want people telling me I drink too much. You know, they don't know what the, that, that fear, that, that terror that's going on inside of me, that I know it, but I don't know how to stop. 
And when I got the Alcoholics Anonymous, that was my greatest fear. You know, uh, you know, how do you live sober? That was my fear. I cannot live without drinking because drinking for me all those years was a way of life. I don't know how to go a day without drinking. And so I sit there and deny. And, and so I, I, so I, 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 it all started and I, and I, and I told you what happened. And then, then the violence started in the ghetto. I'm ending up in, in, in County General Hospital, downtown LA. That's not one of your favorite HMOs, and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and nervous interns, you know, nervous interns stitching me up. Always, you know, they stitch me up when I'm being beaten in the streets now, you know, by strangers in blackouts, and they're they're stitching me up and putting me back out there, and I don't know how to live out there. And early one morning. I was in uh, by the Forum, uh, Crenshaw Boulevard. I've been in, still trying to be a party girl, and, I'm, and my head is against the wall uh, um, uh, uh, curb. And some boot, some foot with a boot on it, cowboy boot, is kicking me in the head. And you know I know about that pain. I can still hear my ribs being cracked one at a time. I know about pain, I know about physical pain, and I know about emotional pain, and that pain has no memory. I'm living the life so beautifully described in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous of total insanity, and it's, it's about the jaywalker. I kept doing the same insane things over and over again with my insane friends and always expected a different result. Um, I was came to in Daniel Freeman Hospital. Uh, paramedics, people who are dedicated to saving your life and you don't want your life saved. How many times did I sit in that chair and contemplate suicide only to learn that suicide is a final solution to temporary problems? And I know where my solutions are today in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, those steps. And I believe that those steps are spiritual and principled. And honoring the traditions of this program has given me a way to live, not based on fear. Um, there was two nuns standing by the bed, a young nun, probably 23 years old, and a four years old, and an older nun. She wasn't thrilled with me at all. <laughs> I kept giving her a lot of lip, you know, through, you know, a busted nose and the police at the foot of the, of the bed. And, and somebody one mentioned here this weekend, thank you, God, that my loving God, that my loving parents didn't, ha didn't see that. They passed on. They crossed that big bridge many years ago, and they didn't see their baby daughter, you know, in, in that condition. And they left. I told them to buzz off, and they left. The older nun, I shall never forget that look on her face. She had on horn rim glasses and, and a dark habit, and she had her hands through those sleeves. And she is leaning over me, and she's giving me what to, and uh, because I wouldn't talk to the police. And, and I told her to buzz off, and she wasn't through with me with that. So she turned, and she walked to the door. She turned, and she looked back. And with that look on her face, and, she just shook her head sadly and walked away. And something touched me. And that look that my, my brothers and sisters had looked at me with, and I remember my older sister, who was a nurse at Cedar Sinai Hospital, looked at me when I went to ask her for money to save the house this last time. And, and she looked at me and said, she said, you know, I, I'm not signing any more checks to bail you out of trouble. It pains us to watch you live the way you live. It's going to pain us even more to watch you die. And that's that look that none was giving me. The young nun stood there, and I've come to believe in earth angels. Because that young nun stood there with, with a white habit on, and, and, and all I could see was this part of her face, and her eyes were as blue as the heavens. And she started to cry. And those tears flowed down on the covering of that bed, and I looked up at her as she got some cotton scrubs and started to wipe the blood out of the corner of my eyes. 
And she quietly said to me, how did you ever let your life get into such a state? No answer to that, young man. Surely not alcohol. That's my lover, my, 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 my companion. You know, I, you know I, I couldn't live without that. It wasn't that. It was all those people that they get off my back. They stopped telling me what to do. But I didn't say anything to the young nun. Three days later, she was um, assigned to dress me. You should have seen her. <clears throat> they, you know, in those days, how they treated alcoholics when they picked them up off the streets like that, um, they, they, they would hold you for 72 hours. And they still do, I understand. I do a lot of work on skid row and, and institution work. But they used to treat you by putting, ga- and pu- putting gauze around the ribs and then rolling off two and a half inch white piece of tape. They hold the tape and they would walk around you and pull it in real so tight that you couldn't stand up so you were left leaning over like this because it's so painful. And this young nun, I'm leaning over, she puts the bad leather jacket over my shoulders and then she takes the wig and she's trying to figure out <laughs> where the bangs went. <laughs> You should have seen her. She kept pushing it this way. And I remember she patted me on the head and she said, you really look quite nice. <laughs> but I wasn't smiling. And I mean, she walked me to the front door of Dar- Darian Freeman Hospital, the spiritual being that she is, and I have come to believe that we are all born spiritual beings. We search for our humanness in this road of life. And she put her arms around me at the front door and she said, try not to drink today. But I'm an alcoholic and I, and I, and I, 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 and I'm like, I shuffle on off and down to the nearest liquor store and don't tell me that that's not insanity. And it was three weeks later, I'm healing, and I came to on that floor in that dirty house and, and the cho- my kids weren't home that weekend. I guess the great, they were with the grandmother. By this time I kind of lost, uh, count of time, and I don't know what had happened to me that April the 9th, 1974, that was different from um, <clears throat> other mornings. I'd never heard of Alcoholics Anonymous. They don't exactly talk about getting sober in bars. Uh, I, 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 I just remembered coming to, it was dark. I still remember the stench of a dirty body and the stench of stale wine. I had lost the will to care. And it's by God's grace that some stranger wasn't in my, in my house that, that morning. Because by that time, the men in my life had faces and no names. And that degradation de- that degradation of, of, um, what it takes just to get a drink sometimes. I still shut up with the shame. As an alcoholic woman, I you know I paid that price. Um, I got up off that floor and I believe what happened to me was a divine intervention. That the Spirit of God must have kissed me gently and said, child, get off the floor. You don't have to live like an animal again. And I got up off that floor screaming, screaming to a God I didn't believe in and asking God not to let me die. Because the fear of dying had always been uh, on the top of my list when my sponsor had me do my fear list. And from a little child, I'd always been afraid of death. And I from five years old. I don't know where that ever came from. But I remember getting, uh, screaming and, and, and I just don't let me die. I didn't know anything about alcoholism or anything. I just said, don't let me die. But I picked up a phone and I called my last friend, uh, Rachel, who lives in in Woodland Hills. And I remember saying, Rachel, I think I'm going to die if I don't stop drinking. And the truth was finally out. That's what I've learned about, you know, the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, that the truth will set you free. And I have felt the sense of freedom just from being honest enough to admit that I, I, I couldn't stop drinking and I was going to die if I didn't. She said, there's a place called Alcoholics Anonymous, dear, she said, and 
Uh, she said, we've been waiting for you and we've been praying for you. And I, and I, somebody else mentioned it about that power of prayer. I believe truly in the power of prayer because it was the prayer of the prayers of the family and the people who, who, who cared about me that kept praying. And I guess, you know, God heard that, 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 that prayer from, uh, <laughs> below that was, um, got me off that floor. And so she said, there's a place called Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think they have a phone. I don't know what they do, but they help each other stay sober. So I picked up the phone that morning, and I called uh, <clears throat> uh, the operator, and I said to the operator, is there a place called Al- Alcoholics Anonymous? And she said, yes, dear, dear, there is. And she said, I'll put you right through to them. And, and she put me right through the central office. And um, a man said, good morning, this is Alcoholics Anonymous. May I help you? And I said, <clears throat> man, my name is Clara, and I can't stop drinking. He said, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. Dear, he said, and don't drink today. We just don't drink one day at a time. And I thought, for an intellectual like me, that seems impossible. How can you go a day without? And I said to him, well, <clears throat> well, thank you very much. I said, but what do you do to stay sober? He said, we go to meetings. And he started to tell me that you go to meetings and, and you know, you get a sponsor. And he was just sharing with me a little on the phone. It was early in the morning, and he had time, and he was sharing with me. And yeah, I just told you my story, and I say to him in my best arrogance, do you have meetings in Beverly Hills? <laughs> and he said, yes, we do, but you're going to the meeting in your neighborhood. I said, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I called my brother. He worked for LAX at Delta Airlines at the time. And I, I called my brother and I said, I, I said, I think you found a place for me. And it's called Alcoholics Anonymous. And he, I, he, I told him what the man had said. And he said, oh, he said, that's wonderful, baby. He said, I, I, I said, but I need a car. And I said, I, to get to the meeting. And he said, all right, baby. He said, I, I, when I come on my way home from work, he worked the night shift. He said, on my way home from work, I dropped the car off. I remember standing by that door when he came, and I could hear him running up the stairs. I'm standing by the door because newcomers, I want to share with you what I felt for the first time. I, a stranger on the phone saying to me, "You don't have to drink today." I felt hope. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous is about. It's about hope, and I hope you get some hope here. Uh, you know, from this weekend, and, and you go to meetings, and you feel that energy of love that we that we we, we give to one another. And he kissed me, and I and he embraced me, and he said, "I hope it's going to work." And you keep the car. So the kids came in to breakfast that morning, and I was standing there for the first time in a very long time. You should have seen them cutting their eyes at me because I hadn't been there for a long time, and. I helped them with their breakfast and their lunch, and they went off to school, and I was wanting to get dressed. I wanted to look good. I didn't know what you guys were about, and I'm standing in front of the closet door and all I do on what to wear. I open, I'm leaning into the closet, and, and I had one dress that was still fit. I was 65 pounds overweight, and, and I had wine sores on my body by now. I had wine, open wine sores on my body. And I had fluid on my joints, and I could hardly walk because it was so painful. And, and I'm trying to look good, and um, and the, the red velvet dress took me half an hour trying to make a decision on what to wear, and I got one dress, and, <laughs> and it had wine stains on it. I cleaned up the stains off the um, off the dress, put the wig out, cut better wet bang, put her on the head farm, sprayed her. She looked wonderful. And I did, I did, you know, just kind of made a little bouffant. And then I didn't know the language around here. And what I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous is the language is indeed the language of the heart. And uh, I didn't know about detox. And I had no idea that I, my body was beginning to jerk around. And the, the muscles seemed like they were pulling apart. And I didn't know what was on. I was determined not to go down to that liquor store. Two o'clock in the afternoon, around one or two o'clock in the afternoon, I didn't know what to do, so I, I decided to go over to the Woolworths and just go browsing. So I'm over there browsing around, and I stole some eyelashes <laughs> from my first meeting of alcoholics. <laughs> And 
and they come quite long, and I didn't know you're supposed to trim them down to size. <laughs> so they come with a little tube of glue, and I've got the little tube of glue along the edge of the lash, and I am bouncing like a motor. And it was an 8 o'clock meeting. I'm 7 o'clock. I'm all dressed like the lashes were the last attraction, so I got them in there. And so I grab my elbow, and I wait for an opportune moment. <laughs> I slam them in, and one end's up here, and one end is down there. I'm too tired to start all over. I lean in the mirror. I say, you are looking good. <laughs> and I went off to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm sitting in that, and I'm sitting in that meeting, and the meeting started, and they asked for the hands of the newcomers, and I didn't know what that was. And the lady behind me touched me. She said, raise your hands, honey, you're a newcomer. <laughs> And I raised my hand, and at the coffee break, she came up to me with a little piece of paper with her name and, and, and telephone number on it. She looked at me with that look. We, you know, we, they talk about, uh, Marianne talked about the uh, looking into the wind of your soul when I look in your eyes. And, and there I am with these open sores, and she's got her arms around me, and she said, we love you. And, I, and, and she said, you go home and you call me, and I'll, I'll tell you what Alcoholics Anonymous is about, and I'm going to be your sponsor. As I stand here this morning, this beautiful Easter morning, she's still my sponsor. <laughs> she lives in the same apartment in Hollywood, and and uh, I still go there, and we sit for hours. We still, we still, you know, have that communi- communication. Um, I. Uh, 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 Gail, the, the, the late Gail Wilson was the speaker that night, and she walked to that podium, and you heard Clint talking about Gail Wilson up on the mantelpiece, and she was a speaker. She talked about that, the things I'd never heard another human being mention about fear, and never mentioned about n- not feeling loved and, and inadequate, and all those feelings I'd always felt. And she talked, she was an airline stewardess and she, she was talked about, you know, I don't know which airlines at the time, but she, and she talked about being, going, being in Paris and she was from Kentucky and, and calling her mother and saying, I am so lonely. I don't know what to do. And her mother said, how can you be lonely in Paris? And, and she talked about that. I was, I was, you know, when you come to this podium and that newcomer is sitting out there and I couldn't believe it. And I, I knew I would, something had happened to me. And the obsession to drink was removed that morning. And it's never returned. It's never returned. And I know indeed, you know, that was a spiritual experience. And the 12th step talks about the spiritual awakening. And I've had many of those, you know, through the years. And Bill Wilson talked about his spiritual experience and that feeling of, of a clean wind blowing through and through. And, and, I, and, and I guess I felt that feeling that morning. Um, I at least got into the steps in that year. It was, it was about 20 of us in 1974 uh, who were all huddled together, we newcomers, and um, we became very active. We learned right off what it takes to stay here. It takes, you know... Uh, commitment and it takes um, service and my sponsor put me right into that. We got into the steps and I, I did that fourth, fourth step and I, I wrote that list and I put my children at the top of the list and, and, and I went on down and thank God for those steps and we do those steps 1 through 12 in that order. I tried to get her to let me pick out the ones I wanted to do and she wouldn't hear of it so we have to do it 1 through 12. And, and, uh, and, you know, and, 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 and it, 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 things went on, and I, and I was told to get a job. I was not employable, and when I was six months sober, I was, I was able to get a job, and I got a job as a waitress, and I was a terrible waitress, so, uh, you know, I never could understand why no, and nobody tipped me. Um, <laughs> I whined all the time, and, uh, I spilled a lot of coffee on people, and, I remember being at a meeting over at 9604 South Central one night at the clubhouse, and I was whining about not getting tips. And um, 
one of the um, uh, gentlemen, he's passed on now, came up and he said, he put his arms around me lovingly after he said the Lord's Prayer. And he said, Clara, please come down off the cross. Um, <laughs> he said, honey, we need the wood. <laughs> I uh, started to make the amends, and I, I and I got better. You know, it was the first time in my life that I had a, I had a job, and um, what I did was uh, I learned to to suit up and show up on time, as my sponsor said, and give a full day's work for a full day's pay. And I started to learn something about integrity, and I started to learn something about you know about being the best that I could be, whatever it was that I was doing. And you know, it, it was really the beginning, and. And, and things got better. I made amends to my children and that little, that little daughter that I couldn't get to her, uh, PTA meeting, you know, and today she's, uh, happily married and I have a great, a uh, little granddaughter and, uh, and she's my best friend and, uh, and I, and I, you know, today she goes to the PTA meeting with her little daughter and then, you know, and, and she tells me, Mom, you know, you're the best mom I ever had. And my friend Denise is, is a very close friend of the family as well, and she shares with Denise uh, about our relationship, and that certainly wasn't that way. And it's by the grace of God and Alcoholics Anonymous and the steps. And that little son who went down there, that ghetto, uh, you know, when I was, um, I guess, seven years sober, he he he's drinking and using drugs, and he attempted suicide, and and, and and we don't drink no matter what. And that older son who walked away and walked out of my life when he was I was three years old, he came back into my life. By then he'd become an actor and he was very doing very well in television and in the theater and movies and whatever you do. And he was working in New York most of the time. Came home and and um, and I sat him in that room and that was a painful experience. It was painful for me to say to him, I'm ashamed of the mother that I was. But I told him how proud I was that I was a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, I learned from my sponsor, it takes courage. It takes courage, you know, to set the things um, right that were, that were so wrong in, in my relationship with them. And I remember he looked at me. He was so handsome. And he looked at me and he said, Mom, he said, you know, uh, that was yesterday, and I'm also a, a double winner because I'm a member of Al-Anon, and my sponsor sent me to Al-Anon, you know, and so by my first five years, I was very active in Al-Anon as well as a, 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 a program. And he said, you know, yeah, it was yesterday, and he said, we don't, we're not promised tomorrow. He said, why don't we all start as a family, and the family act is described in the big book, and, and you know, it, we started with a wonderful relationship, and and uh, as as life went on, I, I went back into that business, that company. I have my own company now for 23 years, property management and maintenance. And, and uh, you know, life is getting better. And I and I just want to share with you about service. Um, when I was about four years sober, you know, we don't get well. Some I I had the tendency. I can't speak for anyone else. But by by the time I was four, back in that business, I bought a nice little house now and. And I've got back at El Dorado and things, you know, and I'm beginning to enjoy the gifts. And I was quietly forgetting the giver. And that's what happens. And I'm, I'm at four years sober and I'm now getting, I don't want to hear how many times are they, are they going to read, um, chapter five and, um, and I'm sneaking away and I'm, beginning to lie. That was one of the things that was real six and seven, one of my defects of character. But I never could tell the truth. And and I'm uh, dancing around the room uh, on a Saturday afternoon and and uh, with a broom and uh, listening to Billy Holiday and remembering the good old days. Forgot those good old days standing in front of a liquor store at six o'clock in the morning and wetting myself. Ignored that completely. And when Dr. Silkworth talks about that insanity returning, boy, it comes back quietly and suddenly, indeed, it's there. And uh, <clears throat> the phone rang, and I guess the God, my loving God, was, it, it was sending a phone call for me. A woman from Central Office, I, I'm, I haven't talked about this for a long time, and 
this woman who is the central office because I'm starting to work with some things that have been going on in my life in the last couple of years, especially the last year, that I've gone had to go back to basis. Um, I, 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 I called, and the woman said to me, uh, this is, this is central office calling. Clara, is that, you, you, we, we have a 12 step call for you. And I said to her, I don't think I'm qualified for a 12 step call. She's got, no, I kept trying not to do it, and, and she, she, she just got really annoyed with me. She said, oh, stop it. <laughs> She said, um, I, I said, well, listen, I had always heard you never turn down an A request. A, a request. So I said to her, uh, well, where is it? She said, well, it's down on Skid Row. And um, <clears throat> she said, and there's a young woman down there in a hotel. And she said, it, it doesn't have a marquee. It just has an address. It's on San Pedro Street. And she said, I want you, you, you know, to go down there. And her name is Dorothy. And I, I said, oh, I wrote down all the information. So I called my sponsor, and I hung up, and I called Carol. And I said, Carol, I just had a call from Central Office, and I said, they want me to do a 12-step call, and on and on and on. And I said, and then she wasn't responding at all, wasn't saying a word. So I finally, when I couldn't get any response from her, I said, look, I don't want to do it. <laughs> and she said, I don't care what you don't want to do. She said, you do it anyway, and she hung up. <laughs> so, <laughs> I always heard you don't go on a test step call alone. So I'm sponsoring this little 90-day actress. She's sober 90 days, living over in Beverly Hills. So I pick up the phone, and I call her. I said, we're going on a 12-step call. She said, where? <laughs> I said, we're going down the skid row. She said, I don't want to do that. I said, I don't care what you don't want to do. <laughs> I said, you get over here. I live in West L.A. I live near Shepherd Hills. So she said, I said, you get over here. So she, she came over there. We get in my big El Dorado. We wheel downtown. And we, we couldn't find it. You know, it's not part of the Hilton chain, you know. <laughs> so we, uh, we find it. We go in the lobby. We find where she is. She's up on the third floor. We get on the elevator. We go up there. And I want to tell you about that 12 step. It changed the course of my sobriety. It brought into my consciousness a God of, that I, a spirit of, a spiritual being that has touched my life. That 12 step call. We, we walk over three drums and we get into the, uh, um, the guy told us that there was no, at, there was no numbers on the doors in that hotel. It was a, you know, when we walked in there, they had a big room, one of those radios up on a shelf. And all these alcohol, it smelled like a latrine in that lobby. And they were dancing. All these alcoholics, drunk, and they were cheek to cheek, romance in the lobby. And they dancing around, and, and I finally get up, we, we get the attention of the clerk, and we get up there, and we knock on the door. And we walk in there, and having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. On the floor was a 20-year-old blonde young woman in a fetal position, water bugs that huge just crawling all over her. And she lost all body control. And uh, the, the wine balls were all over the place. She was 20 years old. And filth, dirty underwear in the drawers, on the floors, and it was a little room, like, I'm not good at sizes, but like five by eight or something like a small room. All of us was a cot, that's all she was sleeping on. And she was turning blue because she was gagging on us as we opened the door. She was, had been throwing up and something was caught in her throat and we didn't know anything about, what do you call it, uh, CPR? We, 
But I looked at, at Constance, and she looked at me, and we, and we screamed, what to do? And we, we just didn't know, but we turned her over on the stomach and pumped on her, and it popped out. And she was actually dying as we walked in that door. Tell me about miracles, because miracles are real. and happen to those who come to believe in them. And we got her up, and there was none of that smart talk between us anymore. We put her between us, and we got her downstairs, and we called central office. I found the phone, and, and we called central office, and what to do with her. And they told us where to take her, and we took her this, to this place somewhere around there. And, and this guy's name was Paul, and they had they took in alcoholics off the street, men and women. I think they housed about 160 at the time. And, um, and, um, and there were two young guys that came that helped us, you know, get her in, into the door and get her registered. And I want to tell you about another miracle. One of those young men at that time, as I leave that night, uh, uh, I was in the lobby yesterday, and he's out there, he was standing in the lobby, and, and he, his name is John. And Mitch were the two, and they are still sober, and they came out of that facility, and he has told me yesterday he's got 23 years. And you see, I don't know what happened to Dorothy. She stayed there two weeks, and we've never seen her again. And you know, God sees to it that, that, that people, other angels touch our lives, and, and that's what happened. And, and you know, and we've gotten on with it. I, um, my son, that older son I talked about, and I got into service, and I started that meeting on Skid Row, that I invited Bill down because of that 12-step call and two or three others that are still going on down there. And I, I got immersed in, 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 in service. And it's been that way ever since. And, and, and this is one of the wonderful ways to find God that because I see the light come on in the lights of, of, of your eyes and when I go on those 12-step calls and it touches my heart and I know there is a God. I ended up, uh, you know, life got well, better, and my, that older son uh, called me one day. He was working at ABC Television in New York, and um, I saw my that little daughter of mine uh, go, when, she, when I was five years old, to the Ice Capades as the first professional uh, black skater with Dorothy Hamill. The grandparents had paid for that expensive training. Uh, and my life got on, and, the, and that son called me, came back, to, went back to, came back to Los Angeles, and he got married. And I have a wonderful little grandson. Uh, he's 14 years old now, and uh, and the marriage didn't last. But that son uh, was teaching um, theater arts uh, up in the Northern California, San Francisco area. And he called me one day, and he said, because he had been one of the products of, yeah, we, I'm sure you've heard of, of the of, of Studio 54. And he, when he was working at ABC Television, he was like the, the, the anchors, the six o'clock anchors. He was, the, he was their unit manager and he was, he, you know, he, that's he took care of the evening news. They, in the, some of them are still doing it that he works with. And, uh, and when that, when 54, that Studio 54 came out, he was around, he had his little gold chain and, and his spoon, and he started shooting a cocaine, intravenous shooting, and, and sharing it in those in those high places with celebrities. And his was out, his was cocaine, and mine was alcohol. And then when he could, when, he, when his when his time was over there, his contract was over, he moved back to L.A. and then he was, went up north. And then uh, he called me one day and he said, "Mom," he said, "You know." <clears throat> He said, I went to the doctor today, and I can't believe it. I'm HIV positive. And, you know, and it's, again, that thing about death. I sponsored a young woman. Her name was Rita. And I, when Rita was eight years sober, uh, she had been an intravenous drug user, and she came down HIV positive, and she was dying of AIDS. And I remember going down to one of the beach cities one Sunday morning and sitting across the table from Rita. And I said, Rita, how do you feel about death, knowing my fears? And she looked at me quietly and she said, death is not the greatest loss in life. The greatest loss is dying inside while you're still alive. And how many times did I die in the back of the limousines and sitting in those clubs and the parties and and when my son said to me, I said, well, I said, come home. 
No, I knew I, I have a home for you today. I never had a home for you when we were growing up. And he said, Mom, I, I'm not ready to come home yet, but when I, when I feel that I can't take care of myself, I'll be home. That son called me 19 months later and said, Mom, I, 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 uh, I'm too sick to take care of myself. And it was at a time. This is back in, in the early 90s. And uh, he said, I, I really don't know uh, 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 how, how, what to do. And they didn't know much about AIDS at that time. And, and he came home, and we had a place for him. And I called my Earth Angels and members of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I truly believe in sponsorship, and I have a lot of women that I sponsor, and my loving family, and we were all there for him. And it was that year that I sat around that bed and thank God that I'd done those steps, and I'd made that closure, and I'd made that, done that eighth and ninth step with him. And, and um, it, it was a long, drawn-out, painful way to sit and watch your child die. It's really not supposed to be that way we we, we know, but, but that's the way it is. And I and I remember standing around that bed that morning, the, the day before the earth, big earthquake. And, uh, uh, my sponsor and my sponsee, and he'd done some work with the Grateful Dead. He'd done some work for them, and one of them wrote something with him, and we, he, he sent it in a music form, and we passed out the sheets, and he asked us to, you know, by that time he couldn't talk, and he used to have to write, and that handsome 175-pound young man weighed 99 pounds, and he would sit there and watch that. And I remember that rasping sound of death, and it was quiet, and he was gone. Remember that pain. There is no pain like that thing. Um, there was a legal uh, pad on the nightstand, and I picked it up, and I took a pen, and I, and I wrote, God, a letter, not a note. <clears throat> Thank you, God, that you chose me as a child to bring your child into this universe. Forgive me for any pain I brought him in his young shot life. But he's in a better place where there's you've taken him to a better place where there's no more crime, no more dying and, and no more pain. And thank you that I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm surrounded by love. And I wrote some other things. And you know that other son that I talked about and he became Alcoholics Anonymous? Uh, he was a very sober member for, he attempted suicide, I guess, when I was seven, he got sober. And one year almost to the day, he tested HIV. And uh, he's my gay son. Love him. So gorgeous. He stopped going to meetings and doing whatever. In August of last year, he is now full grown age. We don't drink. Thank you, God. This program. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And there is a difference. We have the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and the principles of this program that teaches us to live the life that God wants us to live and that we should have the best that life offers. In that journey, you know, there's the ups and downs. I finally found out that's life. And I, you know, and I, and that things have been, not been good for the last two years. I've been, you know, I've gotten back into, uh, financial insecurity. My company has been having problems and, and God always seemed to put somebody into our lives and in the program and, and um, and I've known Denise since um, you know she got sober. She's coming up for 14 years, and and she and I got on my knees and I prayed for help. God guide me, take me where I need to be. So I had need some answers because I I was falling apart and I slipped away from the 11th step, that conscious contact with God, and I you know that that taking back the power and and, and I know that I'm truly powerless over everything, and and she has a management company, and I went to her, and, and, and things are turning around, and, 
And we all we have to do is pray for the answers, and the answers will come. And it's gotten better. And I've gone back the first of this year. I sat down and wrote an inventory. And this is what I did. I started back with the emotions of a newcomer and started all over again to bring that center back to the first step. I am powerless over alcohol, and my life can be un still unmanageable. 27 years, it doesn't matter. It's one day at a time. And I still get the privilege to come and stand before you and share my life, my strength, and my hope with you. And thank you for, for allowing me to do that. And may God bless all of you and have a happy Easter. God bless. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.